James chapter 4. Um, and if you have it, if you can all please stand for the reading of God's holy word. James chapter number 4. And the word of God reads like this. Where do wars and fights come from among you? Do they not come from your desires for pleasure, that war in your members? You lust and do not have. You murder and covet and cannot obtain. You fight and war, yet you do not have because you do not ask. You ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. Adulterers and adulteresses, do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. Or do you think that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously, but he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. Therefore, submit to God, resist the devil, and he will flee from you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter be turned to mourning and your joy to gloom. Humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. The word of God is blessed. The title of this sermon today is called The Flesh, the World, and the Devil. Let us pray. Father, I am nothing without you, Lord. There is nothing in me that is worthy to preach your word. But it's only by your grace why I'm able to minister the gospel of Jesus Christ. So I pray that even in my weakness, even in my frailties, Lord God, that you will use me to edify the body of Christ so that your name may be glorified, so that the people may be instructed, encouraged, and built up. I pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of God. The three enemies in our walk with Jesus Christ, the three enemies for every Christian, every believer, is the flesh, the world, and the devil. The enemy of the body of Christ, the local church, is the flesh, the world, and the devil. The enemy of any Christian Marriage is the flesh, the world, and the devil. The New Testament church gives us a clear pattern of how to function as a community of people. The New Testament church gives us a pattern of how we should worship. It gives us a pattern on how we should choose leaders, a pattern on how we should handle and deal with persecution, the New Testament church gives, up, gives us a pattern on how we should deal with false teachers and false teachings. And even though the New Testament church gives us a clear pattern of these things, we may fall guilty of over-romanticizing the spiritual character of the early Christians. All was not beautiful in the early church. In particular to the church that James is addressing, James encouraged the church while going through various trials and sufferings. James condemns favoritism and partiality within the church. James also emphasizes the inseparable connection between faith and works. He argues that the evidence of true faith in Christ is works. The, the evidence of true faith in Christ is faithful obedience, is 
doing good deeds towards your brother and sisters in Christ. James also admonishes the, the, the church to tame the tongue. He warns the church against the dangers of gossip, the danger of slander, slander and uncontrolled speech. Now James is addressing the conflict that is happening within the church, the fights, the wars, the, the quarrels that is going on in the body of believers. In verse 1, James asks a rhetorical question. Where do wars and fights come from among you? He asks this question, and he gives the answer. And he gives the answer in a form of a question. Do they not come from your desires for pleasure that war in your members? So there seems to be a conflict that is going on in this church. Now, James is not interested in what the conflict is about. He's not interested in what the conflict is actually about. He's not interested in who is right and who is wrong. He is looking at the source of the conflict. James is looking at why the battles are happening in the first place. He's looking at why there is strife and quarrels and contentions among you. He's looking at the, the why, the reason. He's looking at where it's coming from. And according to James, they come from your desire for pleasure that war in your members. Now, the word members in this text is not talking about members of a church. James is using the word members the same way the Apostle Paul used it in Romans 7.23. And in Romans 7.23, Paul says, But I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. So another word for members in this context is the flesh. So James is saying the reason why there is fights in this church, the reason why there is war, the reason why there is conflict within the body of believer is because of the desire for pleasure that wars in our flesh. That wars in our flesh. There are evil desires that is at war in our flesh. We have lust that is at war in our flesh. And the reason why there is conflict in the church, the reason why we might find conflict in our marriages is because we all have desires that is in our flesh that wars in us. We have a desire that says, I want things to be done my way. <laughs> we all have that. I want things to be done my way. We all have this pride within us, this selfishness, this selfishness with us that says, my way is the best way. And if we don't crucify the flesh, if we don't crucify the flesh with the affections and lust, if we don't, if we don't crucify that, that lust, that, that my way syndrome will turn into conflict in the church and it will turn into conflict and fights in our marriage. That's why we must pick up our cross. We must deny ourselves. Now, I want you to notice that before we get into the world and the devil, James is holding the believers responsible for this conflict. He's holding the Christian responsible for the conflict that is going on in this church. Look at the personal pronouns. He says, your desire for pleasure, you lust, you murder and covet, you fight in war, you do not ask. So when, when there is war and strife that's going on in, in the church, when there is war and when there is strife going on in the marriage, the person that is ultimately responsible is you and me. There's no amens right there. Okay, I get it. The world is not ultimately responsible. The devil is not ultimately responsible. The individuals that are involved in the conflict 
are, is, are responsible. So according to James, the devil made me do it will not pass. <laughs> now, James uses strong language here. He uses strong language in his rebuke to the church. He says, you lust, you murder and covet, you fight and war. Now, this lust is a longing. This lust is a passion. It is a desire for things to go your way. The way that you see it, the way that you desire it, you want, you want things to go your way. That's that lust he's talking about. And then he says, you do not have. <laughs> In other words, you want things to go your way. You have this desire, this passion to have things to go your way, but you do not have, so you murder. That's what James says, so you murder. Now, when James uses the word murder, he's not saying that these Christians are literally killing each other. That's not what James is saying. James is using the word murder the same way Jesus used it on the Sermon on the Mount, where murder begins in the heart. In Matthew 5, 21 to 22, he says, You have heard that it was said to those of old, you shall not murder. And whoever murders will be in danger of judgment. But I say to you that whoever is angry with his brother without a cause shall be in danger of judgment. And whoever says to his brother, Raka, shall be in danger of the council. But whoever says, you fool, shall be in danger of hellfire. So what is James' point? James is saying that the quarrelings, the, the fightings that you having, that, that, that comes from this unmet lustful desires, it turns into hatred, it turns into insulting one another. When you have a desire for something to go your way and it's not met, it will progress to hatred, it will progress to insulting one another. That's James' point. So it will lead to insults and hatred in the church and in marriage. And then it leads to covetousness. He says, you murder and you covet. Now, covetousness is a desire to have what others have. Covetousness is a desire to have what other people have. Covetousness says, I want my church to look like that church. <laughs> covetousness says, I want my pastor to be like that pastor. Covetousness says, I want my wife to be like his wife, or I want my husband to be like her husband. And these are all outworkings of the flesh. The source of conflict in the church, the source of conflict in our marriages, comes from the carnality of the flesh. In verse 2 and verse 3, I want you to notice the unmet desires. He says, you do not have, you, do not, you cannot obtain, you do not receive. A life that is lived according to the flesh, a life that is lived according to the desire for pleasure, not only leads to conflict, but it also leads to an unsatisfied life. The flesh could never be permanently satisfied. Never be permanently satisfied. James goes, continues and says that the reason why you don't have, the reason why that, that, that you don't have is because you do not ask. You do not ask. Prayerlessness is the cause of an unsatisfied Christian experience. Many people are saved, they are believers, but they don't have joy, they can't rejoice in the Lord. Why? Because of prayerlessness. Many things that we desire to have, we should have, or we should have possession of, we don't have it because of lack of prayer. And then on the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus encouraged prayer in Matthew 7, 7 and 8. He said, ask. And it will be given to you. Seek, and you will find. Knock, and it will be opened to you. For everyone who acts receives. And he who seeks finds. And to him who knocks, 
it will be open. We don't have the things we need. We don't have the things that we desire because of prayerlessness, because of lack of prayer. Well, some of us may say, well, I do pray. I pray every day. Well, James addresses that too. He says, you ask and do not receive because you ask amiss that you may spend it on your pleasures. So another reason why we don't possess, we don't have possession of certain things, we don't have certain victories is because we do ask, we do pray, but when we ask God, when we pray to God, we ask with the wrong motives. We ask God with the wrong intentions. We ask God from an evil desire. From, we ask God for these things from a place of pride and selfishness. And many of us, we won't think, we don't think that we could go into prayer with pride. The reason why I'm praying to God for this thing to, to happen in the church is so that the church can see that I'm right. <laughs> That's wrong motives. The reason why, God, I'm praying for my wife, I'm praying for my husband, uh, God, I want you to fix this. I want you to change them. The reason why you're praying that is so that your spouse can listen to you from now on. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. Amen. Yeah, yeah. Right? So, 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 so we're praying to God for these changes in our marriage. We're praying to God for these changes in the church, but we're praying with wrong motives. The motive should be, God, fix this thing for your glory. God, fix this thing for your honor. What I'm seeing in the church is not about me being right or, or, or having things my way. What I'm seeing is not glorifying you, so I'm praying this thing so that you can be glorified. God, what I'm seeing in my marriage and what I'm seeing in the church, the reason why I'm praying for, the, for, uh, praying for this change is so that the body of Christ, so that my marriage can be edified. Not to satisfy our sinful desires. Not to satisfy our sinful pleasures. Not so that the, the husband or the wife could say, yeah, yeah, you were right. Even though we like that. I'm not going to lie. I like, I like when she say I'm right. She don't say it all the time, but I like when she say it. Praise the Lord. So then he says in verse 4, and I told you, James is using strong language. He says, adulterers and adulteresses. Do you not know that friendship with the world is enmity with God? Whoever therefore wants to be a friend of the world makes himself an enemy of God. So James introduces the world into this situation. And he says that friendship with the world is enmity, is hostility with God. If you want to be a friend of the world, and, and look at the text, it says whoever wants to be. So just, the, just having the I want to be a friend of the world says you automatically make yourself an enemy of God. You already make yourself in opposition to God. Now I'm going to introduce to you a, 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 a question that was opposed to me a couple of weeks ago. So in John 3.16, we know the famous verse that God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whoever believes in him shall not, uh, whoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. So Jesus says that God loved the world, and that love led God to give his son. So John 3, 16, God loved the world. That's what John records in his gospel. And that same John that recorded what Jesus said about God loving the world, John also says this in 1 John 2, 15 through 17. Do not love the world. This is what he's telling the Christian. Do not love the world or the things in the world for anyone for anyone love, for if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world is passing away in the, in the lust of it. But he who does the will of God abides forever. So here's the question that was opposed to me. If God so loved the world, why is it bad if we love the world? What's well, a fair question. If God loves the world, why are we enemies of God if we love the world? If we are friends with the world, we are enemies of God. I'm glad you guys asked that question. Here's the answer. 
God's love towards the world is God seeing the sinfulness of man. Is God seeing the wickedness of man, the lostness of man, and seeing and providing a savior for them. So his love sent Christ into the world for redemption. When the Bible talks about our love for the world, our friendship for the world, it is talking about us imitating the sinful ways of the world. It is talking about us, talking about us imitating the attitudes of the world, the sinful mindset, the thinking, the thoughts, adopting the thinking of the world. In other words, it is talking about the world influencing us. See, the world can't influence God. The world can't influence, but the world can influence us. Hang around someone that says a certain thing long enough. You'll go home saying that same thing. So James' point for, for pointing out the world, this is why he's pointing out the world. This is where the world comes into place. The reason why the church that he's talking about is acting carnally, the reason why the church is acting so fleshly is because the world is starting to have influence on the church. So the reason why there are fights and wars among you, the reason why there is conflict in the church, conflict in the marriage, is because the world is starting to have an influence. So when people start acting up in the church, acting carnally and fleshly, they have exposed themselves to the world. When people start acting carnally and fleshly in the marriage, that means that they have exposed themselves to the world. They have made themselves a friend of the world. Or as James put it, they have loved the world. And if that's true, if that's true, the Bible says that you have made yourself an enemy of God. Why? It is impossible to set your affections on the world and please God at the same time. It's impossible. It's impossible to have worldly thoughts and worldly affections and still have holy thoughts at the same time because we know the world does not have holy thoughts. And James calls this church who have made friends with the world, this is what he calls this church, adulterers and adulteresses. Mm. James wasn't playing. James was not playing. Now, when James calls them adulterers and adulteresses, he's not using this term again in the natural. He's not saying that the members of this church is, is cheating on their spouses. That's not what he's saying. He's speaking of their spiritual infidelity. Because they have made friendship with the world, they are committing spiritual adultery. Now, remember, James is addressing Jewish Christians. And so he's borrowing language from the Old Testament where God will call Israel adulterers whenever they start worshiping idols. When they're worshiping idols, God will, call, God will call them adulterers because God is the husband in that relationship and Israel is the bride. So in the, in the context with the church, the church is the bride, Christ is the husband. And so when we start being worldly, when we start having our affections towards the world and loving the world and having our friendship with the world, we are committing spiritual adultery against God. In other words, the church is cheating on God with the world. That's what James is saying. So here's my question to you. Are you a spiritual adulterer? Are you cheating on God with the world? Have you made friendship with the world? Instead of the Spirit of God having influence on you, do the world have influence on you? I love what Paul said in Galatians 4, uh, 6.14. But God forbid that I should boast except in the cross of our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom the world has been crucified to me, and I to the world. What Paul is saying, Paul is saying, I'm not going to boast about anything that I have done. I'm not going to boast in my ability to keep the law. I'm not going to boast in any work that I have done. 
The only work that Paul is going to boast in is in the cross of Christ. He will boast in the cross. And Paul is saying because of the cross, because of the cross, the world has been crucified to me. Because of the cross, the systems of the world and the glory of the world no longer have power to attract me. If the world is still attracting you, that means you're not crucified to the world. He's saying that when the world has been crucified to you, the world will no longer have influence over you. It will no longer have power over you. By whom the world has been crucified to me and I to the world. There's a double crucifixion here. The world is crucified to me and I am crucified to the world. When you are crucified to the world, the desire that's in you, that you once had for the world, is now dead. If you remember when you, was, when you first started your walk with Christ, there was still a pull. I'm going to make a confession. It's not in my notes, it just came to me. Before I was saved, before I was saved, and uh, my, my mom is here, help her, help her, Lord. But she knows the story already, she knows this. She knows this story already. But before I was saved, I used to smoke weed. And after my conversion, I was hanging out with my boys, and that pool was there. They were smoking, and that pool was there. I mean, I, I wanted to, and I actually asked my boy, let me get, and he knew I got saved. He said, no. While he's smoking, he's telling me no. <laughs> but after, after my conversion, I smoked twice. The first time, I felt so bad, but I thought it was, you know, something happened to it. It was spiked or something. The second time I smoked after my conversion, I felt bad again. That's when I knew, okay, yes, I'm saved. Something different happened to me. Wow. Something different happened to me. Wow. That conviction, it was conviction. It wasn't anything wrong with the thing. It was conviction. Mm. And then a year or two later, after my conversion, I went back to my, my friends, tried to minister to them, and they were smoking again, and I noticed the pull wasn't there anymore. Praise be to God. Amen. The pull wasn't there to God. That's what he's mean. That's what he means when he says, I am crucified to the world and the world. That pull is no longer there. The influence is no longer there. The desire is no longer, it's dead now. That's the effect of the cross. Or do you, or do you think, verse 5, that the scripture says in vain, the spirit who dwells in us yearns jealously? Now, this is a difficult passage to understand. It's a difficult passage because it depends on your translation, what spirit James is talking about. Some translations have the spirit, lowercase s, which implies the human spirit who is filled with sinful envy, who is filled with sinful jealousy. Some translation has the spirit, capital S, which indicates that it is the Holy Spirit in the believer that yearns jealously after God. This would be divine jealousy, divine jealousy. And I lean towards that this is the Holy Spirit, capital S, in which there is a divine jealousy. So the scripture that, the scripture that James is referring to will be Exodus 20, verse 5, where it says that God is a jealous God, is a jealous God. So when a believer is starting to be influenced by the world. When a believer is starting to love the world, is starting to make friendship with the world, the Holy Spirit that is in us is yelling jealously, pulling you away from the world and pulling you towards God. That was that conviction I was telling you about. When you are starting to go towards the world, there is the Holy Spirit in you and say, don't go, don't go. God is a jealous God and he's pulling you away from the world closer to God. But he gives grace. Verse 6. But he gives more grace. Therefore, he says, God resists the proud, but gives grace to the humble. So James quotes Proverbs 3, 34. And in doing so, he introduced a contrast. The proud and the humble. 
And he goes to tell us how God deals with the proud and how God deals with the humble. He resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. The proud in this context are those who are fighting because of the desire of the uh, uh, desire for pleasure that is in their members, that is in their flesh. That's the proud. The humble are those who are lowly. The proud are the spiritual adulterers. The humble are the poor in spirit. This is what pride says. Pride says, God, show me your kindness because I deserve it. That's pride. Humility says, God, show me your kindness according to your mercy. Pride says, I have earned God's favor. I earned it. Look at all the good that I have done. That's pride. Humility says, God, I don't deserve your favor. I don't deserve your mercy, but I beg you for it, God. That's humility. And how do God treat the proud? He resists the proud. That means he opposes the proud. God is hostile towards the proud. God is against the proud. But the humble, the lowly, the poor in spirit, the Bible says he gives grace. He gives grace. What is this grace that God gives to the humble? This grace is God's merciful kindness towards you. When God gives you more grace, it means that he's giving you a power that will turn your heart towards Christ. When God gives you more grace, that means that he's giving you power to keep you in Christ. When God gives you more grace, he is giving you power to increase your faith in Christ. This power increases our knowledge of Christ. It increases our affections towards Christ. When God gives you this grace, he gives you, he causes you, he causes us to walk in holiness, to walk in righteousness, to cause us to live godly on this earth. That is the grace that he gives to the humble. The humble will cry out, Lord, I am insufficient. Lord, I am poor. Lord, I am needy. I am weak. I feel this pull from the world. I feel this carnality that is in my flesh. Lord, I need your grace to pull me closer towards you, Lord. That is the humble cry. And if you are humble and you cry that out, the Bible says he will give you grace. Verse 7. Therefore, so he said all of that to say, Submit to God. Resist the devil, and what will happen? He will flee from you. So now James introduces the devil into the equation. He starts with the flesh. He goes to the world, and now he's at the devil. There's a reason why James is doing this, and this is what James is doing. The reason why there is conflict in the church, the wars, the fights, the, the bickering, the, the contentions that's going on in the, in, in the church is because of the war that is in our members, the, the sinful inclinations of the flesh. But the reason why there are sinful inclinations of the flesh is because the flesh or the, the people in the church are being influenced by the world. And guess who influenced the world? The devil. That's what James is doing, the devil. So he's going through the chain of influence. The world, the, the devil influenced the world. The world influenced the flesh. And people are just acting out in church or in marriage. So James is commanding the church, submit to God. 
The world is being, you're being influenced by the world. You're acting carnally. Stop it. Submit to God. Submitting to God is active, not passive. Submitting to God is putting yourself under the authority of God. It is putting yourself under the authority of Scripture. Submit to God. Resist the devil. <laughs> Resist the devil. Not command the devil. Resist the devil. Not declare and decree the devil. Resist the devil. Not bind and loose the devil. Resist the devil. Nowhere in scripture is it taught for the believer to engage with the devil. What is taught in scripture is to resist the devil. And when you submit to God and resist the devil, what will happen? He will flee from you. He will leave you alone. Who is the devil? The devil is our adversary. The devil is, is, is like a roaring lion seeking who he may devour. The devil is the evil one. The devil is a murderer and a murderer from the beginning. The devil is the tempter, the accuser of the brethren. The devil is a liar and the father of life. The devil is the god of this age. But guess what? The devil is a defeated foe. <laughs> Oh, yeah, I should have been shouting for that one. He is a defeated foe. According to 1 John 3, 8, he who sins is of the devil, for the devil has sinned from the beginning. For this purpose, the Son of God was manifested. This is the Son of God. This is Christ. For this purpose, what is the purpose? That he might destroy the works of the devil. The cross of Christ destroys the works of the devil. If you are a believer, if you are saved, the cross of Christ had destroyed the works of the devil that was once upon you. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners. Purify your hearts, you double-minded. Lament and mourn and weep. Let your laughter return to mourning and your joy to gloom. We have an invitation and we have a promise. The invitation is draw near to God. Draw near to God. You are invited to draw near to God. And what is the promise? He will draw near to you. Draw near to God in worship. Draw near to God in praise. Draw near to God in prayer. Draw near to God in study and meditation of his word. Draw near to God by enjoying holy communion with him. Draw near to God by rejoicing in his glory. And he promised that he will draw near to you. Why is this invitation, why do we have this invitation to draw near to God? Why is, John, why is James inviting the church to draw near to God? Here's the reason. Because the church is not as close to God as they think they are. The church is not as close to God as they think they are. They are not as near to God as they ought to be. When a church or when a marriage is involved with fleshly and worldly wars and conflicts and contentions, the indication is they are far from God. I don't know about you, but when I have some seasons when I'm not deep in prayer, when I'm not seeking God as I ought to be, I get real irritable. I'm, I mean, I get frustrated quickly. 
That's what he's saying. The reason why these, fle- these, these wars are going on, that the, the flesh is, is, is active and is alive in the church, you're being influenced by the world so easily, is because you are, not, you are not near to God, draw near to God. Draw near to him. That's why the invitation is given. Drawing near to God helps us to overcome the flesh. Drawing near to God helps us to overcome the world. Drawing near to God helps us to become holy and pure. Drawing near to God helps us to lament over our sins, to mourn over our sins, to weep over our sins. There are some people, they can, they can sin and they can, they can act rebellious towards God and towards the church, but there's no mourning, there's no weeping, there's no conviction. Why? Because they're far from God. Drawing near to God helps us to get along with our brother and sister in Christ. Why? Because the Holy Spirit is the spirit of unity. Lastly, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord. This is another promise. And what would happen? He will lift you up. Don't lift yourself up. (laughs) Humble yourself. Get low. Humble yourself before this good and holy God, and he will lift you up. When you humble yourself before God, he will lift you up out of your carnality. When you humble yourself before God, he will lift you up out of this quarreling and strife. When you humble yourself before God, he will lift you up out of worldliness. When you humble yourself before God, he will lift you up out of the devil's grip. Humble yourself before God and he will lift you up, lift you higher in worship, higher in holiness, higher in the knowledge of God, in the knowledge of Christ, higher in the understanding of the truth. Higher in consecration, higher in the love for the church, in the love for the gospel, in love for the people that are lost. Humble yourself in the sight of the Lord, and he will lift you up. If you are not a believer, the most humbling thing you can do today is humble yourself before God understanding that we are all sinners who deserve the wrath of God upon us. We must understand that there is nothing we can do to earn his favor, nothing we can do to earn his grace. There's nothing that we can do to save ourselves from God's wrath. That's the bad news. But the good news is there is someone that can do something, and that has done something. And that is the Son of God who is the Christ. His name is Jesus. And approximately 2,000 years ago, he was on the cross, and he took on the full wrath of God. He lived a perfect life. He fulfilled all righteousness. Innocent man, but he took on the full wrath of God upon himself. And he died on that old rugged cross, and he was buried for three days. He did that for our sins. But guess what? On that early Sunday morning, he did not stay in the grave. When the women went to the tomb, the grave was empty. He rose again bodily from the grave, conquering sin and death. And if you humble yourself and place your trust in that Messiah and the Christ, He promised to save you and give you eternal life. That is the ultimate him lifting you up. Because he's lifting you up out of the darkness. He's lifting you up out of hell. He's lifting you up out of his wrath. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we are so thankful for your word, for your truth for your spirit. I pray, Heavenly Father, that the people that have heard this message that are not believers, that they will place faith in Christ and that they will repent 
of their sins, putting all of their trust and hope in Christ for salvation. And I pray for the believer. I pray that your word will sanctify us, that would, your word will give us a love for your truth, a love for the Son, and a love for each other, that we will be united in the Spirit, Lord. That we will not act carnally, that we will not act fleshly, that we will not have all these contentions and quarrels and fights and wars, and that we will not be influenced by the word, world, but we will be influenced by your Spirit, influenced by your Holy Scriptures. I pray, God, that you will help us to be more like Christ so that when you come back for a church without a spot or wrinkle, you will see that church in the glades meets that. Pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. <clears throat> Praise the Lord.